Okay, yes, my presentation will be on midterm. Uh, I will not be posting any readings for my presentation, but but yeah, you uh, you know I uh, I can't say I am encouraging you to attend the um, class because I will be making it more um, like interactive. Okay. Yes, and I just posted a note to the um, uh, to the um, pizza thing, uh, or to the chat thing. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ozan will be on the midterm, but he will write. He will write incredibly difficult questions as well. Okay. Now, um, now this is a new a new thing for me. I want to show you people a short. Um, a very short thing from YouTube. So I'm going to get it on the screen and then we'll see if I can get myself to get it to you. Okay. So first I have to get it on the screen. I'll do that. I have to go over here and get rid of this thing here. Go to there. Put that there. See if we get this up here. The days of the visitors. Soon be over. Yes. You you haven't shared your screen, Dan. No, I don't know whether you whether, the, whether people can see this yet. So you have to share your screen. You have to share the screen. Okay, so I think I'll share my screen. I have to get out of here. Okay. I have to go to there. There we go. Oh, I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'm going back to the beginning. And what this is about is an introduced, a newly introduced insect to the United States and Canada called the giant hornet, which is a big, big, big version of a yellow jacket wasp that you might see on a picnic uh, in the United States in the summertime, a yellow and black wasp except this thing is as big as your little finger. It can be as much as two inches long and uh, the diameter of your finger. So what I want to show you is, oh, let me add, its, it's biology is that it's a predator on honeybees. So what it does is it goes into a honeybee nest and finds one. It goes back home to its nest, gets more wasps, and they all come to the honeybee nest. And then they invade the honeybee nest and they chop up the honeybees and the pieces which they take to their own brood back in their own nest. Well, in Japan, this was also introduced in Japan from Southeast Asia. And the honeybees in Japan have been there long enough. So they've evolved a defense to these wasps. And this YouTube is a YouTube of that defense. The actual URL for it is on the first slide of the lecture today. So you can go back and look at it again if you're curious. This will not be on the exam. This is something that I think is interesting and I think you should know about. Um, so here we are. We, the first thing when we start off is they catch one of these wasps with a uh, butterfly net and then they um, put a little um, wire harness on it so they can carry it and hold it and bring it to a honeybee nest. And I want you to see what happens to it in the honeybee nest. Now they're catching the wasp and he's putting a wire around the wasp on like a little harness. So now he's got the wasp on the end of a wire. What he's gonna do is go to the honeybee hive, which is right here nearby, and puts it down on the doorstep of the hive. Now watch what the bees do when they see it. You see they pile on in large numbers. And something very interesting is happening. Now watch when he puts a thermometer down. Down 
a thermometer down into that ball of bees around the wasp. Notice that they're not fleeing from the wasp. Now watch the thermometer and watch it go up. And it'll go up to about 40, about 40 degrees, 41 degrees. That is very hot, that's centigrade. That is oven hot. That's very, very hot. And what the wasps are actually doing is creating a ball of bees. I mean, what the bees are actually doing is creating a wall of bees around the wasp, which raises the temperature high enough that it kills the wasp, even though the bees themselves can tolerate that higher temperature. So the wasp is susceptible to this high temperature. So what he's doing now is walking around over to a house where there's a table and he's gonna put the ball down on the table and um, you see what, what happens. Now the bees, you see, the bees have stayed with it. Now they, they, these are not, these are bees that would normally be killed by this wasp. And that's what's happening in the United States, I should add. Now then what's gonna happen is he's gonna lift that out and um, he take, he take lift the ball out. Yeah. And then uh, uh, just give it a second or two. And he waits, the bees, I think he chases the bees off. And now you see the wasp, which is stone dead. So these bees have evolved just in the time that they've been from China to Japan, this group defense against this wasp, which is also in Japan. And so what's happened is that the wasp, I think it's also introduced to Japan. I'm not certain about that. But whatever it is that when the bees got there, they obviously suffered heavy mortality from it. And that mortality led to selection for this behavior of this group behavior and why I'm sticking this to you now is this animal that we're going to talk about today is one who does things as a group. Okay, So we'll leave it there and I will get off YouTube here now and um, away we go. Okay, so now strength sharing is stopped as the shared window is closed. Now I'm going to go over to here and get this one. There we go. There's that. Now, are we, um, let's see here, we're going to go back to screen sharing. Or are we already in there? Yeah, screen is shared. Yes. We're there? Okay. So, let me get the little pointer here. Okay, so this is the Hornet and the Honeybee story in YouTube. That um, uh, This is really collaboration. I mean, this is real. This is, of course, a beehive, a honey beehive is collaboration. But this is collaboration in addition to the normal uh, collaboration of building the hive and the wax and on bringing in food and all those kinds of things. This is something added onto it that you can see very clearly. And here's the URL for that. Now, the animal that we're talking about today is called Castor canadensis, otherwise known as a beaver, which is what I'm sure you've heard the name. and. Um, this is the one that's in North America, Castor canadensis. And this guy is a heavy duty mammal collaborator. Okay. So here's where we start the story. We actually don't start it in North America. This is the European beaver. It's a terrible picture. I can't get a better one. Um, but it's a, 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 a European beaver called Castor fiber as opposed to Castor canadensis in the New World. Um, this thing is the native one in Europe. And um, this animal was pushed basically to extinction. Uh, it was hunted and uh, trapped in the um, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, down to effectively zero. People talk to it today, talk about it today as being hunted to extinction, but it wasn't really. It was down to almost extinct. Um, then it became protected, and the population is built back up again. But this is the way the story starts: is with the European beaver because the story starts not in North America, it starts in, um, uh, it starts in Europe. And how it starts in Europe is this. This is a photograph from the 1700s. Um, 
and these very properly dressed gentlemen having their photographs are characteristically wearing these top tall stovepipe hats. At one time, there must have been millions of these because they would have been owned by basically everybody who wanted to be middle to high class in, in Europe. Well, it turns out that the hat itself is made out of felt, F-E-L-T. And the felt is the sheared off hair from a beaver. And there's a very peculiar characteristic of beaver fur is that when it's sheared off, there are two kinds. There's a long fur and short fur. And there's two kinds. And when they're mixed together and rolled out flat, with a rolling pin on a flat surface, they form a dense, tough felt that can then be, that can then be molded and, and formed into these very special hats. So this, the beaver skins that you perhaps have heard about as being harvested from North America and certainly harvested from Europe were not for meat. They were not because they were pests. They were to get that fur to make these top hats. So they were a fashion item. Now, this is the North American beaver, the one that we have right here, Castor canadensis. And you see the long separate hairs that you can see very clearly sort of on the outside. They're called guard hairs. The idea being, of course, that they're, they're tough and stiff and they are the guard for the very dense undercoat of very fine, fine hair that protects the beaver from cold and um, any other kind of thing, but basically cold um, is, is one of, that's one of its functions of this dense velvety guard hair, I mean, velvety under fur underneath the long guard hairs. Now you're gonna, we're gonna talk more about this animal as a whole, but uh, what you're seeing here is the little hands out here in front, just like on the mouse that we were looking at before, they pick up things just like mice do, hold them in their hands and, uh, and, and chew on them or whatever they're gonna do with it. The long flat tail that you see here, we're gonna talk about that, and the webs between the toes on the hind feet. This is an aquatic animal. Now, there was this movie a few years ago called The Revenant, and if you wanna get a idea, but only a Hollywood version of an idea, um, about the fur trade that was going on in North America, which almost extinguished the North American beaver to get that same pelt. Um, see this movie, the backstory behind this movie or the technical understory of this movie uh, is um, about the fur trapper trade in uh, the Northern US and, and, and Canada. And it was a very famous uh, first run movie at that time. But now let's get down to reality of the real way you leave Hollywood behind. And um, this is a, a photograph I took in uh, probably first, second year in college um, in the Mississippi River bottoms. These are the banks way back here on the horizon. And this is an enormous flat uh, extension, wide, broad piece of the Mississippi River, frozen hard. This is about uh, a foot, about a foot deep of, of ice here, maybe, maybe. 10 inches of, of ice. And um, there's a person over here for scale. Um, what we're focused on is this pile right here. And this, what looks like junk on the ice here. Now what this actually is, is that you see back here on the horizon, there, there are trees way over there. Well, the beaver himself or the, the beaver themselves, because there were probably five or six beaver inside of this house right here swam over to these trees, cut them down, picked up branches of things that an inch in diameter, two inches in diameter, held them in their mouth and carried them on, on the water, all and swam with them on the water all the way back to here and put them deep down in the mud right here where the water would be two feet, three feet, four feet deep. Embed the base in the mud the tips of the, of the branches stick up above the water. So that's what you're seeing here above the ice. And in effect, it really, all the tissue that's underwater is stored just like you would put uh, celery in your ice box in a glass of water to keep it um, fresh and, and, um, and, and not spoiling, not drying out, be good to eat. Because what they're gonna do is this is their winter food supply. So they're gonna eat that, the tissue off of those branches 
um, during the winter when they can't get out. They're I can't, can't get out of this ice here. They're 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 ice bound underneath it. Now, we were over here inside of this house, and what it does is there's two tunnels inside the house, which go down from the interior of the house down through here underground and under through the water and the mud and come out here and so the beaver can swim out over here and pick up the pieces it wants, cut off the pieces it wants underwater and take them back up into the house to eat them. The house itself is made out of mud and um, we'll talk about the interior of that house in a short time. But what I want you to notice here is that it's got a layer of snow. Uh, in other words, the house is sticking up above the ice and the snow here. And it's also got a layer of snow on it here. That tells you that this is frozen ground. And if it's frozen ground, we have three or four or five or six big mammals inside this thing, generating all their heat. They're fully furred and fully just pumping out the heat, but the outside is frozen hard. We'll come back to that point in a minute or two. Now, this is a young, Beaver House. This is a, well, a person here for scale again, and um, this was a small house and made by a new a new couple. So what happens is is that back here, these the mom in here produces kids every year, and when the kids get to be two years old, the family kicks them out. So we have a family unit here, but when you get to be about two years old you are basically expelled from the family, all right? So you, you have to go out and find your own house. But what they do is leave this, this is in the summertime now, leave this, swim out of the river, swim up river, down river, and off to little streams, looking for a mate. So the male and females, young, these young ones meet each other out there somewhere. And then they find a place where there's enough water and enough mud to push the mud up add sticks to it for some substantial material and build their own little house for just two right here. So this is the first, this is a, a, new, a new house for a new couple of beavers. This is what it looks like close up. All this mud that you see here has been dredged up off the bottom by the beaver in their front paws. So they, <laughs> they go down to the bottom, scoop up big piles of mud, and literally hold it against their chest and swim up and then plaster it on top. The branches that you see here all peel. You see there's no bark on them. <laughs> they all look like bare bones. That's because it's been eaten off. These are basically kitchen trash. In other words, they're the stuff that's left over. All the little twigs here and the bigger things here <coughs> after they've eaten the good part on the tree branch. Now here's another one, same thing, except this is a much bigger house. This will have four or five, six individuals in it. And again, as you see here, the snow on the outside is not melted. Now, if you're an insurance, if, excuse me, if you're an insulation salesman in New Jersey or Minnesota or Wisconsin, and there's a suburb around some big town like Minneapolis, and you want to find houses that need insulation for their attics, for their roofs. What do you do? You wait until there's a nice snowstorm that produces a layer of snow, a half an inch or an inch, and you drive up and down the streets looking for a house whose roof does not have snow on it. That tells you that it doesn't have insulation underneath the roof. So you knock on the door and you go in and you make your pitch, all right? Well, what they're seeing here with the beaver is that this, this mud layer here with all the sticks in it has frozen so hard and it's about eight inches to 10 inches thick, maybe in to, to 12, 15 inches in some places down here. It's frozen so hard that it, it is itself insulation. So this is summer temperatures inside and Arctic winter outside okay, over a distance of just about 12, 15 inches. In other words, this is an engineering marvel can put together by the whole family. They all work together and they build this house on a pile of mud that they scooped up as a platform first, and then they build the house on top of it. But right up through the center, there's a, a, a hole, a chimney, about four inches in diameter, four or five inches in diameter. And if you climb up to the top of this beaver house and stand over the hole, you can feel the hot air coming out of there like a furnace. 
In other words, this thing is, they're creating heat and it has to go somewhere. If they didn't have a roof like that, it would eventually melt its way through the sides of the thing. And of course, that frozen mud is their protection in a world of predators. In a world you had wolves, and bears, and other kinds of predators who would walk across the ice, get right to that house, which was a very obvious object, and dig their way in, they are frozen out because this frozen mud is hard as concrete, okay? Um, so that's the structure that the beaver have built. And like I say, out here are these things here that are sticking in the, in the, in the water. That's underwater preserved for, for winter food. Now here's another one. This is in the summertime now. And um, I had a class in Northern Michigan and we were out trundling around and we found this pond with this beaver in it. I mean, beaver house in it. And at a glance, it was obvious that the beaver had moved on. Now, what I want you to do is think about how just at a glance, you know, the beaver are gone. Now, the first indication that, indica indicator that you see is all this greenery growing here. These are weed seeds that were brought there by bird defecation or by wind and have started to grow on the outside. If this was an active beaver house owned, this would all be smooth mud, dirt, and stems and, and branches, uh, peeled branches, no greenery at all. In other words, they don't let that stuff accumulate on the outside. So that's the first thing it tells you right away, it's an abandoned beaver house. The second thing is that you can see a lot of the woody material here exposed. Why? Because the wind, the, the rain has washed the mud away. Now, in the, if this was an active house, they would be constantly replacing the mud. So there, it's an it's a active maintenance problem for them. They're constantly getting more mud and bringing it and putting it there. The third thing you notice is right here is a lily pad. I'll show you later on a rhizome of a lily pad. This is an aquatic plant, which has got a big fat rhizome functioning like a tuber in the mud below. And then long petioles leading up to the leaves that you see here on the surface. That rhizome is a chocolate sundae with vanilla ice cream for a beaver. And it's growing right here next to the house. No way, no way would this be here if there was an active beaver family there, because that's the first thing they would eat. Right? And finally, a fourth thing is this hole that you see right here. That's the tunnel that goes into the chamber inside. There'll be one over here on the other side as well, two of them. It's above the water. If this thing was a was a was a um, an active family in a bat and beaver house, that water would be up at least to having that under underwater and practically more likely to be about here somewhere. But how do the beaver keep the water up to there? That's where the pond came from. They built a stream, a dam across the stream that made the pond. And by maintaining the dam, it keeps the water level up. So what you know is if they're if, if this entrance hole is exposed, what you know is that they have gone and they're not maintaining the dam anymore. So the water level is starting to fall at this level. Now there's a fifth thing that you can see, but you kind of have to know a lot more to see it. All of this low vegetation that you see out here along the edge like this, those are all in the family Ericaceae, which is the family that has blueberries, cranberries, um, and, and all those leaves are famous for being extremely toxic. Beaver can't eat them. They have eaten all the edible stems and trees around the margin here. There just aren't any left at all. Okay. This is a diagram that I picked off the web last night of the same process that you were just uh, we were just talking about. Here's the food, the food pile out here. Here's the tunnel that goes up inside. There's the platform inside where they all live inside. And here's that air duct that you see up here on the, on the top side. Now it's terribly out of focus, but um, the whole point being that this is sort of a, 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 a Google version of what I've been saying to you. And there's the dam down here, which as it says here, has got a raised water level. Yes, it does, it makes a lake. This was just a stream beforehand. 
Now, there's another thing on the well, which I thought was kind of funny. Here is an advertisement for build your own dam. So here's something that looks just like a beaver dam, except there's a, is this, is that, here's this, build your own. Something is very missing from that photograph. Very, very missing. What's missing from that photograph is there's no beaver. This is a mark of an abandoned beaver pond. And it will not maintain itself. Look at the abandoned beaver. Here's the abandoned there. The house we were looking at is back up here about 50 meters to the left. This is a class of students walking on the top of the dam. And you notice you can see the dirt. If this was an active colony, you wouldn't see any dirt. Because the beaver backed the water up so thoroughly that the water goes over the top of the dam. And they maintain that continually. So as the water washes some of the dirt off the top of the dam, they come and put it back again. And that's the first thing the kids learn. That's where kids learn how to do all this kind of stuff. Well, excuse me, I should be careful there because I think a lot of it is genomic. I don't think, in fact, we know a lot of it is genomic, not something you had to learn from mom or dad. But what you see the kids doing is working with mom and dad, doing that extra, putting the extra mud back up on the top of the dam. So here's a dam that you know is active. The pond in the uh, house is upstream on my right, and the downstream is on the left. And um, you can see the water flowing through the top of the dam. And the beaver maintain that all the time. If this ever breaches so that there's a, you know, a slot through there, the whole lake goes whoosh right out through that, through that breach. So that's their real protection is the, and the, the water, of course, protects them from predators. It gives them the safe place to have their house so that they can be safe in during the winter time and store their food. So the, the dam and the house all go together, obviously, here. But this is a real beaver dam. All these beaver dams that are shown is very striking to me. I looked at about, uh, I don't know, 40 or 50 images on Google um, of beaver dams, and they were all of abandoned beaver dam. All of them were ones that were in the process of being breached. Now here's what a breaching looks like. You see, all of a sudden you can see an exposed top here with no water going over the top. And right here, that's flowing water coming out from the pond, which is under this ice, going out through there, dropping down through here and coming out down there. This is now draining the pond, which is underneath this ice. Something happened to the beaver colony whether it was a trapper or a predator or a disease, I have no idea, but they weren't maintaining their dam anymore. So they were losing the lake right here. And um, so this is all these exposed things. Well, of course, this makes, this is very easy for a photographer to photograph. And in the summertime, it's even easier. And so that's what you get on the web is a whole lot of photographs of abandoned beaver dams presented as though they were active beaver dams. Here's one of this, oh, sorry. Go back to here, well, now we go upstream to this thing. So here up the, the lake that way, we get, sorry, wrong way. There we go. Uh, this is me doing a, uh, setting traps here in the underneath the ice, a um, long time ago, obviously, uh, for the house, which is right here on this lump of snow. And I didn't understand enough in those days to just look at that dam and realize that their beaver were gone. There was at least one remaining because the one remaining finally breached this house, came out of a hole on the side here and walked across the snow to get food from one of these two branches up here. Because as the lake drained, the ice collapsed. The ice roof that was left behind when you drain the ice collapsed. And you can see this, see this slot right there like that, a line and another line which runs right down through there like that. That's the edge, the broken edge of the ice plate, the roof that was across here. So I'm actually down below here. It says about four foot drop, something like that, to where I'm sitting, you know, standing down here on the, on the, on the ice. So this is a, a simple point for us, is that that pond is, is life for beaver. Because of course, as soon as he comes out of the house and walks out here going after food, he's sitting duck for wolves, for bobcats, for cougars or pumas or bears, or you name it. Well, a bear would be hibernating, but all the rest of them would be out here being predators. And a beaver is basically helpless when he's out here and doesn't have water to retreat into. 
But here we are back to the lake that goes with the um, uh, house, the abandoned house we were looking at before. And once again, the house, the family's gone now, right? So here's these toxic plants here. There's no more willows or aspen or any of the highly edible little trees along the edge. They've got them all. And see the second house, which is right here? That's the second beaver house. That one is also abandoned. But right here is a whole lot of lily pads. That tells you immediately they've been gone at least a year. Because this, as I said before earlier, when they were near the house, these are the things that are really high quality food from a beaver standpoint. Now, there's more dynamics going on here. This is a, what's called a beaver meadow. See back here is flat covered with weeds, herbaceous things. It's a winter time now, of course. And there's a stream going out through here, but that stream is going through an old breach of an old beaver dam. So here's the dam here. So what happened is the family was up upstream here, built a dam, the dam backed up to the lake. Then they, they lived there for two years, three years, five years, whatever period of time. And so back here behind me, is a flat area like this. And also then um, up here is another one from another dam downstream. But here the point being that it creates a beaver meadow as it's called, because when this is abandoned, the beaver are eaten, right? they leave. And when they leave, of course, then it starts to regenerate. But also what happens is the lake drains and turns it back into a stream again. So here's that downstream from there. And here's all this flat area out here that was a lake at one time. And this behind me, just like it, is another lake at one time. Now, you're just off the boat from Europe. It's 1650. You have an axe, a wife, and a couple of young kids, maybe. And you're turned out into this forested wilderness to survive. It's covered with big trees. The big trees block any kind of agriculture that you would start doing. Whatever kind of seeds, or crops, or tubers you've got, you don't have a place to put them. Now, yes, you could go out and start cutting down the trees. Of course you can. But look at what the beaver have left for you. This nice, flat, open, sunny spot full of high quality sedimentary soil. So what do you do? You make use of these beaver meadows. So the beaver meadows very early on were very quickly colonized by Europeans coming from Europe as agriculturalists looking for a, just a place to survive. So these became the sources of a lot, a lot of early farms in the 1600s, the 1700s, 1800s. Things were, were where you, you had a, this kind of a, a frontier situation. And, um, and so they were a very important part. At the same time, that same European culture was busily extinguishing the beaver to get as many of them as they could for their skins, which then went back to Europe and were valued like gold for making those top hats. So that's the interaction between this beaver and the, the basically the, the European invasion of North America. Now here's the actual animal itself, close up, just trapped. Now there's two kinds of ways of trapping them. Um, show you a second one in a short time. Uh, this is a, one that was invented much more um, uh, recently and, and when I was in high school. The other kind dates back to the 1800s and earlier. Um, but this is called a conibear trap. And what it is, is this square you see right here is spring loaded. This is a spring right here. And um, it opens up as a square. And in the center of the square, you hang a little bundle of green twigs, which you see right here. And then you cut a hole in the ice and you suspend this thing underneath the ice. So the beaver comes along, sees the twigs or smells them, I don't know which, goes over and sticks its head in to grab a hold of the twigs and the trap shot shut behind its head, as you can see right here, and drowns the beaver. Well, kills the beaver, drowns the beaver, some combination of the two. Now, this illustrates a very interesting thing about this animal. Notice this is heavy ice that you're seeing here. And so this is heavy ice water. 
there's guys out there swimming around in that ice water. They can swim in that ice water for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, a long time. And um, uh, repeatedly, over and over and over again. So, I mean, we're talking about a, a naked animal. It's not on a wetsuit, a naked animal in ice water. Well, of course, the fur, in part, serves as the wetsuit. So, but the fur, the wet, the water does not get down through that dense under fur to the skin itself. It gets through the guard hairs on the outside, but not through the, um, the velvety, uh, very, very dense pile of, of hair underneath. But notice how hot it is. Here's caught in a conover trap. Fever's buoyant, it floats. So what happened under here was it got caught under there, it died under there, but it was so hot in this cold water that it floated up against the ice and melted a hole in the ice. And then as it cooled, it froze into the ice. <coughs> so to get it out, I had to cut out this big chunk of ice and pull it out of the water, out of the ice, get that up on the, up on the, on the ice shelf, and then gradually chip away the ice from the outside. Just emphasize what the temperature was. Now, so I am here at high school trapping beaver and <coughs> I bring one home, I put it on the kitchen table and then I have to go to school. But as I'm leaving the kitchen, I look at it and I see little insects crawling all over the back of the beaver. Much to my surprise, they look like little beetles. And I was very <coughs> surprised about them. And I thought, well, so I got a bottle and I put some in the bottle and I thought I have to go to school. So I am going to put these in the ice box to calm them down and sort of make them quiescent. So I'll even keep doing something with them, see what they are when I come back home in the afternoon. I come back home in the afternoon and these beetles have been in the refrigerator all day long. And they're just happy as clams. They're running all over inside the bottle. They're not slowed down at all by the temperature. No, no insect, nor normal insect would, would be able to do that. Any insect you care to put in a refrigerator, uh, it will become torpid in a few seconds or a few minutes. And um, basically, in fact, the tropical insect is dead. Uh, but up here, that's not, not, not the case. But a lot of insects have uh, basically um, antifreeze in their, in their blood system. Um, but these beetles that were on there, they're called, it turns out they're called beaver beetles. They're well known for living in the fur of beaver and they feed on excrescence, just little bits of, of tissue, um, plasma, uh, leakages of lymph uh, through the blood, it's, uh, through the skin itself. They don't chew in, they're not like a mosquito sucking out. But the point being is these guys are active, happy, doing their thing in this fur in this ice water and did so in the refrigerator as well. And they live for days and days and days in a bottle in the refrigerator. So that's telling us something very interesting going on in the temperature gradient between the ice water and the hot insides of the beaver. Okay. Now these are uh, skins in my driveway, um, beaver skins in my driveway in high school. And um, what I want you to see in these, we'll come back to them shortly, but. Um, these are just stretched, uh, as you might have seen in the year 1800, uh, to dry in the sun. But right here is little lines running on the underside of the skin. Okay, and here's more. See more little lines running like that, and lines running through there like that. That is the strike from my knife slicing the fat layer off of the underside of the skin. Now, if you take a mink or a rabbit or a weasel or a rat or a squirrel or any kind of animal, and you peel the skin off of it, obviously a dead one, uh, you pull the skin off of it, the skin itself is basically leather. Not, not, not preserved like leather is, but it's skin, just like yours is, all right? For the beaver, the skin is firmly attached to a thick layer of fat, about a centimeter thick, right underneath the skin. So you had to use a knife and slice it off a quarter inch at a time. So it would take me an hour to skin a beaver, whereas an, a, a, a dog or a, a wolf of this size, uh, it could be skinned in 10 minutes or two minutes. Um, so the point being that, that um, this guy has got this extra layer of fat right up against the skin. 
And what finally realized, we finally realized was that the drop in grade in temperature from the outside ice water to the hot inside of the beaver occurs not in the fur, not in the skin, but somewhere in that fat layer from the skin to the interior of the animal. So the insects who live in the fur, in the ice water, that's their normal temperature is basically four degrees centigrade. I mean, just, just regular, to, you know, they're, 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 that is, they're, they're, it's normal for them. If you heat them up, I forgot to mention, if you take them out of the refrigerator and put the bottle on, a, on the countertop, in a couple hours, they're dead because they can't handle the hot temperature, which just tells you something about the sort of micro details that a given individual thing, and in this case, an eagle insect, has to put up with in its dealing with the world. He's not like you are who put on coats and walk around and seek out warm places and cold places and all that kind of stuff. They, these guys are restricted to quite narrow worlds. So let's look at a little more of the anatomy himself. This is a tail, obviously. This is a roadkill. Um, and um, uh, beaver tails have a long, reputation in novels of being something that the beaver trappers ate and that people would eat and that they would be food. You trapped a beaver and you ate the beaver tail. Well, this was obviously, obviously nonsense. The tail has got nothing in it. It's very thin. As you can see here, we turn it on edge. So here it is flat and you just turn it on edge. And what that is basically, that tail is, is basically cartilage, bone, sorry, cartilage, bone, um, and uh, skin on the outside and uh, a light circulation through it. And more than a light circulation, right here at the base, where it goes into the body itself, there's a set of small muscles that allow the beaver to simply close down the circulation to that tail. So it doesn't cool off. I'm sorry, it doesn't get, it, it just goes, at, it just stays at the water temperature and doesn't inject cold water from its circulation into the body of the animal. That's also true for each foot. So if a beaver loses a foot, as we'll talk about later on, uh, as a beaver loses his foot, these muscles clamp down at what at its wrist or ankle and stop the blood flow outwards. But when it was a normal happy animal in the water, it didn't put in, bring cold water from the feet into the body itself because the muscles can contract and restrict that flow. And the, the tissue itself here, which doesn't have any muscles in it really, this is all guided by muscles that are inside the body here, um, doesn't need the heat to do its job. This is a beaver walking on ice and snow. And here this broad thing you see right here is the drag mark from the tail. And that beaver first is in trouble because he shouldn't be out here walking on this because of course this becomes much colder than water does with ice in it. So he shouldn't be out here walking, he's in trouble. He's run out of food or something like that. So that's why he's out here walking on the snow looking for other something else, water or pond or a hole through the ice or something. And the whole point being that as he does this, his tail can get frostbitten. The webbing in his feet can get frostbitten. And that's from the fact that the tail requires a, a narrow spread of temperature to be functional doing the thing it does. If it gets too cold, it gets gangrene from frostbite. If it's too warm, well, it doesn't need to get warm. It just works fine there. But the point being that it, it's this, the tail itself is a, is a very special organ in addition to being important for, for swimming. And I guess I realize I just didn't mention that is that if you watch a dolphin swim, you'll see that the, um, and compare that with a, how a fish swims. Remember a fish, the rear end goes side to side. The dolphin, the rear end goes up and down and the whales as well. So they're mammals, right? They're in the water. So their rear ends go up and down. The beaver tail goes up and down as well. So that's how he swims is up and down. Not like a fish, which is side to side, side to side. Okay. And the webbing and the feet, you may think, you know, if you just looked at that foot without thinking about it, you think, well, that could be a duck or a goose. 
you know, he's, he's gotten, he's built, he evolutionarily built webbing between his toes so that he has a hind foot here, obviously. Um, and so that he gets a, a good stroke with every time he uses that as a paddle underwater. So, so it's convergence on birds, for example, and, uh, and other animals who are aquatic. But there's your famous teeth that you already see in the front end of the, um, um, in the front end of the uh, Lyomi's mouse. Um, but let's look a little more closely at them. Notice that they're first outside. Just like I said on the mouse, the mouse can close its mouth behind its teeth. And the beaver can close its mouth behind its teeth. So when he's swimming in the water and doing things in the water, the mouth, the, nothing has to go into his mouth in order to use those chisels in the front. This is a roadkill again. This is what the teeth look like straight on. These are the, and these are ever growing. So when I had a pet beaver in the house, you, 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 well, what happened was I trapped one and brought it home. And um, two things, I guess several things that need to be mentioned here. One is a very social animal. So the, the group of beaver, the males and females and the kids in this pond with the house and the dam, all work together as a unit. They're very social to each other. And what we discovered was that I brought a two-year-old one home that had just basically, I suspect, been kicked out by mom and dad. Um, within being in the, in, the, in the living room for I don't know, a few hours, uh, I was sitting in my lap eating a carrot and um, uh, became a very friendly animal. And um, so you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and he's sitting in the middle of the living room floor going ding, 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 grinding his teeth. And I didn't understand what this was all about. I learned by watching him and sticking my hands in his mouth. These are ever growing incisors, not like yours. They're ever growing. And so what he's doing, if we look at this from the side, is he's taking the, the sharp edge up here and using it to chip, to grind away or chew away the flat edge of the lower incisor here. And then he takes this piece back here, the hard edge on the lower incisor, and uses it to cut away the upper side, the back, the back side here of the upper incisor. So the teeth are continually growing from here and from there. And he has to continually be sharpening them one against the other. So every night, you could hear him sitting there on the middle of the living room floor, grinding away, and chip and chin, polishing his teeth, if you like, sharpening his teeth, if you like. So these are the front ones up here in front. And they're the ones that he uses to cut wood to, in order to get the, the goodies that are around the wood. You know? So that, that's the, the functional piece. These back here, the molars, are not ever growing. Okay? So here they start out like this. And now we're looking straight down on them. The striking thing is, oh, sorry, back here, notice that this outer edge here is yellow. And that's a very hard, hard tissue. The inside edge here is white and it's soft. So that's it. So here's the yellow hard part on the outside. And then the white on the inside uh, back there is the softer part. So he can cut that away with the outer hard outer part can cut the soft part here and vice versa for the one from the bottom going up to the top. Well, now we look down on the molars. And you see that they're very, it's got all these ridges here like this. Think of that as, as a file, you know, something with multiple multiple ridges and a, a file, an opposing file on the, on the lower side. And these things are, are grinding against one and the other. And, um, but here, the white one is the hard one. That's the outside. And the soft one is in the center. The yellow soft one is in the center and that's the one that's being ground off more rapidly than the outer side one is. So that always keeps a ridge above a valley. And so that's how they, how, that's how they, how they operate. And so the grinders here for grinding up the, the soft tissue from the outside of the tree and the big incisors here at the front are doing a totally different job of cutting down the tree. So here again is a very blurry photograph of the perpetrator um, snatched off the web again. Um, and uh, so here's the, the tree that he's just uh, busily cut off. And uh, here's a close up of one that you can see much better. Here's the actual lower strikes from the lower um, uh, 
from the, this is the, sorry, it's the uppers that cut this and the against the lower anvil thing. And what I want to emphasize here is they do not eat this. This is not food. This is what is cut down in order to get to the food. So the food is up here on the tender higher branches. And this is the living part of the tree here, not the dead storage uh, water transport pieces that are back in here. This is the living part of the tree, um, uh, cambium, and um, that's what the beaver actually are eating. So they don't eat wood, they don't eat trees, they eat the, the, the living part of the tree on the outside. These are more twigs that have been peeled. Look at the pattern of this. This is the result of holding the twig in your hand like this and twirling it while you nibble. So the, the teeth, the front teeth are slicing off the outer, the incisors are slicing off the outer peel edge of this and um, uh, leaving, the, leaving the, the wood piece behind. So the very characteristic signal that there are beaver here. So the same with these over here. Now, when I came here to the University of Pennsylvania, and I noticed this river called the Delaware River that's between the university and the airport, um, I uh, asked people if there were beaver in that river. And I, I was assured by everybody that, oh, of course not. Well, the, the animals have been extinct here for like forever, uh, long gone. So I go down and I walk the shores along the Delaware River on the, on the campus side. And the first thing I find the first hundred feet is several of these twigs. These are basically left behind by those two-year-olds who are exploring, looking for new places to set up a house. And so they go up these big rivers and nobody sees them. They just go up the river looking for little tributaries coming into the, into the river, and then they go up the tributary and look for another beaver, and da, 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 okay? But the simple point is, they're all over the place, but people don't know they're there, unless you look for the, the little drop twigs, because what the beaver does, of course, is goes up at night on the bank and cuts down a little willow stem, or a little aspen stem, or a little poplar stem, and peels it like this for food, and then drops it and goes on uh, upstream. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing you can use as a, as a way of knowing uh, where the animal was and looking for tracks, but the tracks aren't something in the mud. Okay. Now this is uh, Yellowstone National Park. Um, and uh, when, uh, when he was new to this part of the world, uh, we had this great idea that we would go out to Yellowstone National Park and see a beaver dam and a beaver house and all that. So we go and um, we look and we look and we look. And it's a big national park, right? Where it protects all the animals and all that kind of things. No beaver. But there's the, the signals of beaver. So you see a place that looks like this. And see all the dead trees that are lying down here? Those are beaver. They're trees that beaver cut off many, many years ago. The stump here and the trunk itself there. And, and they're, they're they were cut by a beaver, but there's no sign of any actual beaver house or a dam or anything like that. And then there's some fresh ones. See the fresh ones, all these stumps right here? That's a recent beaver cutting by some beaver. But we looked very hard and we couldn't find the house or the dam. So I suddenly realized, whoa, we should be looking outside of the park, not inside the park. Now, what? What is going on? Well, what it turns out is, and this is a condensation of a long story. Um, in the 30s, in the 1930s, the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park was told that we have to eliminate all those nasty wolves because those nasty wolves are eating bison. And bison are our national em emblem after we've almost extinguished them and begin to recover them. Uh, they're also eating like, the, the poor other animals as well. So they're just horrible animals. We have to get rid of them. So there's actually a, a book that recounts this that the you know, director then said, well, I'm a federal employee. I have to do what I'm told to do. Um, but he calls together a bunch of reporters and he says, um, all of you come out here this spring and take your photographs of spring wildflowers because it is your last chance. And what's that gonna do with wolves? What he realized and understood was that if the wolves were not keeping down the bison and the elk and the deer and the beaver, 
to some kind of low density, there wouldn't be any herbaceous plants because they would be all eaten by these big herbivores. So they eliminated the wolves and exactly that's what happened. It was a big overpopulation of, uh, of the big herbivores. And in fact, when you go to Yellowstone today, the tourist doesn't notice this, but you drive down the road, you, there is what, a, what is called a browse line as in B-R-O-W-S-E, a browse line that you can see very clearly which is the undersides of the tree canopies at about the height that an elk can just reach or a bison can just reach if he stretches his head upwards. They eat everything down at ground level. Well, what it turned out was that they had eaten everything down that the beaver would also eat as well. So what we needed to do to find a beaver dam was to go outside in the park where there are predators called hunters, where there are wolves now, bury a bit, and, um, and competitors called cows. So what happens is in a world where the, um, uh, where the beaver is not, uh, shall we say, eaten out of house and home, then they do their thing. You get this kind of thing all over the place. But inside the, inside the park uh, at that time, but just recently I've learned that when they reintroduced wolves, then the beaver came back inside. So now you've got beaver back inside the national park. Okay. Now, some trees are just plain too big, all right? This is like uh, two feet in diameter or something here. And the beaver tried very hard to get this tree, but they just gave up, all right? And never did. Now, the, I took the photograph because of that. But later on, I'm walking on the bank back here and I fell in a hole. The hole turned out to be the insides of a beaver house because there are what are called bank beaver who do not build houses out in the middle of an open pond. What they do is dig their, burrow their way through down here underwater, make a tunnel inside and then go upwards and scoop out and build out a large cavity inside of the bank. And they live inside of there just like they live in a house out there in the open pond. But if you're walking along the top, you can very easily step right on the air vent that goes right up through the top of the roof of this internal uh, cavity that's inside of there, which is what happened to me in this place. Now, this is a photograph from the margin of the lake that we were looking at with the abandoned beaver house in it. That I showed you the different signals and how you would know that, that it was abandoned. The lake is ringed by conifers that look like this. What happens is these are starving beaver and they try all these trees. What they find is what they get is a mouthful, a face full of resins and turpentine. That's the conifer protection against these gnawing animals. These are reverse animals that will eat bark. And um, uh, they give up and they don't cut the tree down. But this is the part that is just showing chemical defenses in action uh, with respect to the beavers, the chemical defenses that we talked about way back at the beginning of the semester. Here's that um, chocolate sundaes and uh, ice cream, you know, ice cream uh, rhizome for the lily pads that I was talking about before that the beaver love to eat. And this is ecologically a tuber. It isn't, it's not grown on a root, it's the actual stem. And these are the bases where the stem leaves were attached with these pockets you see here. And this is the storage organ for the, for the aquatic plant. And these things are not compatible with beaver because beaver just dig them up right away and happily eat them. Now, this poor animal, which is huge, uh, that's about uh, six feet, seven feet from here all the way back to here, is a, a Pleistocene beaver. Uh, Castoroides ohioensis, um, which lived in North America up to about uh, 1,200, about 12,000, no, excuse me, what about, yeah, about 12,000 years ago, 10,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago. And um, this particular individual is a juvenile, so he's a little smaller than a full grown adult, and he was walking along the banks of the Minnesota River when the banks collapsed on him and buried him. So they, we have a whole intact, perfect skeleton. 
that was buried underneath a, a collapsed bank, like a landslide. Well, let's look closely at the head of this animal. It's been called a beaver, and it is a beaver from many, many respects. But look here at the incisors. The lower ice is, are this knife edge, and the uppers are going to flat surface on them. Now, in the proper beaver today, it's the reverse. The lower has the flat surface, and the uppers have got the knife edge. I don't know really what that tells me, but it tells me this is a different animal. It's an animal with a different biology. And my suspicion is that this is a dentra that worked with aquatic vegetation of kind of animal, as opposed to big woody trees. But I think it's also interesting that I don't know anything about the ancestors of either this or the beaver, but somehow the S selection allowed it to go in different directions uh, in terms of, of uh, incised or formation through evolution. The molars are the same. See, the molars are right here. They're the same as the ones that you saw on a beaver. Now, beaver trapping was very effective. Um, the first Europeans, the real frontier kinds of people, recognized beaver skins as high quality gold from their standpoint. So they went across North America, basically in search of beaver skins, which they bought from the Indians and in which they harvest uh, indigenous people and they, which they also bought uh, and, 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 uh, trapped and, and shot themselves. Um, so how do you do it? You know, what, what's the actual process that they went through? Well, in this case, I'm standing uh, next to a hole. I've just cut through the ice here for a beaver, a beaver pond. And this stick is going to go down in the hole. And right here is a, um, a little bundle of twigs that the beaver would like to eat. So that's going to go down here. And here's a little platform here with an actual trap lying on the little platform. All right? So this is going to go down in that hole, waiting for our beavers. This is 60 years ago when I was in high school. And um, here's what the trap looks like. Here's the Here's the steel trap here. Now that's a very small trap. And what it's meant to do is catch the front foot. So the beaver would put his front foot down here at the time that he was going after the bundle of twigs that you see up here. Now, a beaver can weigh 60 pounds, 70 pounds. I put your finger in that trap. You can pull it out very painfully, but you can pull it out. And a beaver would be able to pull his front foot out of that trap. And I was told by all the old beaver trappers that I had to use much more powerful traps than this. This is basically a trap for foxes. And, um, and they're, but they weighed a lot, they were heavier. And I didn't want to carry all those, all that metal, all the distance from going from one beaver pond to another beaver pond and walking up and down the rivers and stuff. So I liked these little fox traps, uh, which weighed very little. So I was started out as a civil engineering student, not in biology at the University of Minnesota. And um, I discovered in the Department of Engineering that in the basement, they had a, um, a spot welder, one of these uh, big machines that you put two pieces of metal in there and you pull a handle down and it, it welds one onto the other. So what I did was to keep the beaver foot, it's still inside the trap, was weld on the underside of this jaw right here, a strip of metal, to which I had welded a set of nails. So that makes teeth. So now when this closes, the teeth go through the wrist and go through the hand and they don't, then it's not something that the beaver can pull out. So that's how it was actually done. That's how I actually kill these animals, which today I love and enjoy very much and would never possibly be able to kill one today. But in those days, when you're 17 and 18, 19, you don't think about those things, or at least I didn't. This is a, a newly killed beaver, a newly trapped beaver, excuse me, which I'm in the process of skinning. Here's my knife, and here's that fat layer I was talking about. See, this is dense layer of fat, and I'm basically slicing the skin off uh, from that. Of course, if I slice through the skin, that lowered the value of the price. Here's my gun over here. Uh, my mittens and backpack are over here, and there's that same thing that you saw for the beaver set that went down through the through the hole in the ice. These water are in the drainage canals built by the Norwegian settlers who came to northern Minnesota 
in the probably the late 1800s and early 1900s when there was no more good farmland. So they were turfed out, basically excluded as immigrants onto very, very low grade swampy soils. So the first thing they had to do was build big drainage ditches running across these huge areas of low soils of low, excuse me, low fertility, uh, high water and drain it. So it's like draining a swamp. And they still died of starvation and were gone. So I arrived much later. The house sites were still there, piles of rocks for the marking the edges of the houses, things like that, but no people at all. But the, dam the canals were still there. And what did the beaver do? The beaver viewed the canals as another stream. So they dammed the canals and made little lakes. And so that's where I was trapping the beaver, was in those little lakes. Now, how do you actually trap one if you don't have ice? So here's, this is now we're in the, in the spring, so the ice is gone. Here's the bank here. Right here is a pile of mud. That pile of mud was made by a beaver. And after he made the mud, he turned around and applied his rear end to the pile of mud. And there's a glandular exudate from an anal gland and a thing called a castor gland. I'll show you the castor gland in a moment uh, at the rear end, which he then deposits that material here. And that is his signature. And every beaver coming out of the air, sticking its nose up out of the water, sticking its nose up into the air and sniffing knows who that was. And if it's not one that belongs in the pond, he definitely knows who he is. And he goes racing over there to attack that beaver as an invader. Okay, So we have now the family unit with this little village, if you like, protecting itself against an invading beaver who can be nothing but trouble. All right. So what I learned to do, of course, was to, here's this pile of mud. I put the trap in the water right here. So as the beaver comes out and walks up to this pile of mud to sniff it or to put more on it, uh, it gets caught. Or as a biologist, something that never seemed to occur to the old beaver trappers, I realized, wait a minute, it's got, got a castor gland, an anal gland. I'm dissecting these things to get the skin off of them. So I just collected this castor glands from one beaver got a bottle of mineral oil, which has no odor, no flavor, nothing, chopped up the castor gland and the anal gland in the mineral oil and carried that around in my pocket. And so I would just go to a beaver pond, make a little mud pile and shake a little bit of this mineral oil with the perfume, if you like, the signature of a foreign beaver onto the mud pile. And immediately when they would come out of the house, the first thing they do is run over to here and get caught. This is the castor gland. This is the uh, interior of a pocket off the off the uh, large intestine, right at the anus, and um, this is a roadkill in uh, Colorado. And um, the uh, fibers that you see here are the fibers from the uh, cambium, the bark, the soft edible bark layer of aspen trees or willows or any one of those favorite uh, trees that they feed on. So it comes down through the beaver, gets shunted sideways and then ferments in here. And that's the thing that this beaver has as his own signature, which will be different from any other individual beaver. So here's the outcome of this kind of thing. There was a mud pie right here. You see the, the mud was there. The trap was here in the water. And the trap is over here on the right hand side. Um, I can't see it because it was blocked by these photographs, but that's all right. I think you can see it. It's a pair of metal jaws around the front foot. Now the way this, this is a drowned beaver. This is a beaver who drowned himself. And they, he drowned, period, and I trapped because I trapped him. Uh, and the way he, this thing was set up was for me to wade out in this water to it's about uh, armpit deep here and pound a stake into the bottom. And from the stake have a, tight wire that runs up to another stake up here on land. And on that wire, put a slide that goes down the wire, but not up. So the trap is attached to that slide. The beaver puts its foot into it, dives into the water to escape, goes down to the bottom, but he can't get back out of the top. So he drowns. 
So that's a way the trapper is viewpoint is getting it, not having the beaver spin out of that trap by leaving its foot behind. And I caught beaver relatively frequently that had last one foot or in one occasion, two feet um, to traps in earlier in its own history and, and kept living on. This is about a 55 pound uh, adult male. You can see how large the tail is here. Here's a person here for scale. Um, so this is as heavy and big as a large German shepherd. This is the entire family of that particular beaver pod. This is, the, um, this is a pregnant female. She had five little ones inside of her. Um, this is a, 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 a non-reproductive female at this moment. Um, this is the male here. And these are two two-year-olds who are about ready to go out on their own. Now, I've just said to you that there's a female pregnant here, a non-fertile, a non-reproducing female here, and then the male. The beaver trappers all felt that these females here were maiden ants. What I found by trapping and keeping track of who I was trapping is that these are not maiden ants, they, the male alternates. So what you get is one year, she's the kid bearer, and next year, she's the kid bearer. So you have a, a, a social structure in there, which isn't the one that the, the, the beaver trappers themselves had sort of imagined what might have been going on given their own cultural beliefs about family structures. These are those old skins that I showed you earlier when in high school and I was just learning how to do this. Um, and this is what it looked like in my, um, let's see, my, my first year in college, uh, second year in college, excuse me. I my, supported myself and my wife uh, on, um, this is um, 33 beaver skins. Um, and we ate every single one of them. They're extremely good in the sense of veal or, or pork or any other kind of uh, regular supermarket meat. Um, and um, this paid our rent and food for one semester. Um, and, and, and all, and in other words, what I'm trying to say is, is that at that time, as the beaver was coming back in North America, it was nearly extinguished and then it was protected. And then, then it was allowed to be hunted. Now they're called vermin. So now there's a bounty paid on them. Now, why would there be a bounty paid on beaver? Because beaver love streams and streams flowing across agricultural landscapes go under roads. And when they go under roads, there's a culvert under the road. So what the beaver tries to do and wants to do is to turn that culvert into a dam. So beaver just love to come out of the river, find a cornfield with a stream somewhere near it, along the road, um, going across the cornfield, wherever it happens to be, and plug it up. And you plug it up and it starts to make his own little lake. And of course that makes the farmer not at all happy. So now we've gone from a nearly extinct animal to one that was uh, protected and, and grew back and even reintroduced into Pennsylvania, reintroduced into other states. And, um, and, and, and finally then got to a point where I could get a license to do this legally, you can see the tags, the metal tags that are in each one of these skins. Each one of those goes with a, a purchased uh, beaver trapping license. Um, and so it goes to that. And now to the point where you can't even, you can't even get sales for beaver skins, both because they're, okay, they're very common. Anybody can shoot them and do it any way that they want, want it with them. And because of course, fur is no, animal fur is no longer fashionable. So the value of these as beaver skins, uh, which is $25 in those days, it gives you an idea of what they were. Remember in those days, gasoline was 19 cents a gallon. So that gives you some idea of what that beaver skin was worth in, in 1961. Okay. And there's bycatch. This is an otter who got caught in one of my beaver traps. So here's the house here. And unbeknownst to me, the house was abandoned and the beaver and the otter family was living in the, in the beaver house. So I set the traps to catch the beaver. And I, in fact, I've got, I caught the otter and the otter skin, I could not bear to sell it. It was very valuable at that time, but I, I felt very terrible about having killed this otter because I thought otters were really neat animals. And um, uh, the skin of this otter is still in my refrigerator here at the University of Pennsylvania because I can't bear to, uh, to remove it from, from me. Um, now, 
the last thing, or the, I meant to have one more slide. Remember at the beginning I showed you the caster, ca caster fight, um, uh, the one from Europe, the species from, from Europe, um, caster fiber. Um, that has been reintroduced into the UK because people there think it's a really a neat idea to have beavers again. Well, somebody in 1946 introduced the North American beaver into Southern South America, into Chile and Argentina at the bottom end. And it raised holy havoc with everything because there were no predators. And the outcome was that they're, it's viewed as an extremely damaging pest at the present time because they make their dams everywhere, they do tunnels, they cut down trees, they do all kinds of things that people don't like. So it's gonna be very interesting to watch what happens to the UK when they have a free population of beaver again because they were eliminated, I'm sure, in the old days for their fur and for the, for the meat itself. Nobody would have thrown a beaver away um, if they got it. Um, and, but the outcome of this is that um, this is a highly predictable train wreck that uh, England has just, um, uh, the UK has just, and of course they're full of all kinds of ideas about how oh, we can restrain the beaver to keep them in place X, Y, or Z. Uh, no way. Okay, we'll stop there then. Thank you very much for today. <laughs>